Hello! Today I'd like to take an in-depth look at New Frontiers, the latest DLC for Tropico 6. This DLC is all about launching your Tropicons into space. You'll have to set up a space complex, research and test new rocket parts, and eventually reach the moon, then forward onto Mars to claim it. Unfortunately, we don't get to race against Elon Musk, but if we did, they would definitely show him that El Presidente is a true boss. I'll cover the new buildings made available by the DLC, then walk you through how to successfully colonize Mars in the sandbox. The space complex is easily the biggest buildable in the game, but it has enough space to host a number of specialist buildings that will in turn construct the various parts of your rockets. As you might expect from the description, the DLC is all about expanding the end game of Tropico and you'll need to have a robust materials and manufacturing infrastructure to provide the goods needed to craft rocket components. Your economy will also need to be quite robust in order to keep your balance sheet in the profit as your space program gets on its legs. It makes for an interesting endgame goal that will stretch your country. To help you with that, the DLC provides a number of new buildings. The fusion reactor is an upgraded version of the nuclear reactor, but it doesn't require any fuel. Just put it on a beach facing the sea and it will provide a heap lot of energy for free. Realistically, once you've got fusion reactors, you shouldn't need to worry about energy anymore. This is good because the new reclaimer can be constructed near resource buildings to turn pollution back to resources. They eat up a lot of energy, but they're worthwhile because energy is now unlimited, but resources are not. So it's worth exchanging money and power for limited resources and cleaner air. You also get improvements to your farming in the form of the agriculture tower and synthetic food lab. The new feature in the DLC is that you can expand them upwards for better production and storage. Basically this means that you can significantly improve your food production, but without taking up much more space in a single building would. The problem is that they can't do everything a normal farm does. The agricultural towers can only grow cotton, bananas, pineapples, sugar and cocoa. That means that they won't replace your tobacco, coffee, cotton and rubber farms. You also need to provide them with manure, which is not needed for hydroponic farms. So you need another building dedicated for that and that's a drawback. The synthetic food labs can take corn and create milk, cheese, meat and coconuts. Manure can also be produced and you'll need a tower dedicated to that if you also use agricultural towers. So it's not automatically the case that towers are better than hydroponic farms and you'll have to make your own assessment. Personally, I found that a combination of hydroponic farms growing corn and synthetic food towers using that corn to grow other food products works well and doesn't require you to worry about producing manure. The same goes for the capsule cluster. It's a lower standard apartment for poorer people that you can expand upwards for massive density. But you do have to be mindful that hospitals, restaurants and other supporting infrastructure will have to cater for more people in a smaller amount of space and might get strained. There is the option of using domes however. There are self-contained residences that have all the food, care and entertainment infrastructure within them. Basically, you citizens shouldn't need to go looking for food and other needs anymore. All of these new buildings require a lot of energy, so the first thing you should do is make sure your fusion reactors can keep up. The new vertical expansion feature is particularly useful on smaller islands and means that you'll be able to host the large population needed to keep your space program viable even in the smallest of islands. So how does the space program play? Once you've completed all the buildings within the space complex itself, you can get on with the task of constructing the rocket parts. Each building is responsible for one part and you can click on them individually to see how they're doing. The space program window will show you what's needed. You can request a grant from another country to borrow their parts for this mission and if you meet their goals, you'll unlock that part for future rockets. Each rocket needs several parts. You can see what's available in each section. Only one cabin and engine can be constructed, but you can have multiple holds and tanks to extend how far you can go and how much extra payload you can take. More advanced parts have more complex requirements, so your industry will need to be well developed or you'll have to be willing to spend large sums to import them from other countries. An important point is that each engine has a weight limit. Go above that and you won't be able to take off. How much you actually take is set in the next window. You can adjust how much fuel and payload to actually take and set who qualifies to take part in the crew. Events may require you to spend some of these in case of trouble. Once everything is ready, you'll need to begin selecting your crew and boarding them. Random pedestrians who meet the criteria and happen to be going past the space complex are eligible to join the crew. 
Once the brave or perhaps foolish volunteers have been gathered, the launch button will become available. Press it and off to space we go. You'll be treated to a nifty launch animation as your rocket fires its engines, takes off from the complex and leaves the planet's atmosphere. The fourth tab tracks how far our current spaceship has gone and gives you a listing of the possible missions and how much fuel they require. Past failures will also show up in this list as debris that we can salvage for extra fuel and supplies. You can also see the progress on the bar at the top of the window that visually tracks where you are. Every mission carries the risk of failure, and events can happen that will require you to spend fuel or supplies. If you didn't take enough, then the mission will fail right there and then, and these will show up in the list as new debris that can be explored. Reaching the moon will allow you to unlock two random components, but only the first time you get there. Subsequent visits will allow you to prevent disasters for a period of time, depending on how many crew you sent, or mine a load of cheese. Because as everybody knows, the moon is made of cheese. From the palace reveals that they number in order to reach Mars and successfully colonize it, you'll need to carry out multiple launches. Make sure you're always taking third-party research grants. They'll help you unlock more parts, so you'll need fewer launches to get better components. Successful grants will give you access to the next rocket upgrade. Make sure to use the borrowed component, but the others can be whatever you want. It's best to go for rocket upgrades early on, because better components are heavier, and there's no point having a good part that you can't use because your rockets are too weak. Failures are not complete failures either. If you can reach the last location, you'll also get the option to unlock an upgrade. So an alternate strategy to speed up research is to keep launching cheap, minimal rockets, deliberately fail them right after launch, and salvage the remains to unlock new parts. Very gamey, but very effective. Whatever you choose to do, keep launching. Once you've got a good set of components, it's time to go to Mars. A good setup would be at least a reliable nuclear engine and the comfortable cabin, as well as the top upgrades for cargo and fuel tanks. You want to minimize the chance of failure, and that should give you the least chance. If you're going to send hundreds of your people at once, then it's a really good idea to try and keep them alive by minimizing the error chance, or providing them enough extra resources to account for errors. You'll see many of the same events as you did while going to the moon. Once you arrive, you'll have the choice of colony spots, and each one will give you a particular bonus. Mostly the bonuses to efficiency, such as team set transport efficiency and boat movement speed, but you can also get a direct money bonus and faction loyalty. These bonuses are very large if you can fully colonize a location, but it seems that it will require around 400 people to get the maximum bonus. You will need a large population to avoid disrupting your island back on Earth. An interesting feature is that you can choose to give the opportunity to particular members of your population. So if the religious fanatics are giving you trouble, then you can send them off the planet. Which makes for an interesting parallel to how colonization in the Americas got started historically. The New Frontiers DLC succeeds in adding new features that will add variety to the end game. The steep requirements for rockets will test the way you've set up your country, and successfully colonizing Mars will require a large population a broad resource and manufacturing infrastructure, and a strong economy. But beyond that, the gameplay involved in the space program is different from the typical gameplay mechanics in the base game. This variety and the new campaign missions will freshen up the end game for veteran players. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Let me know what you thought about in the comments. Feel free to leave a like, subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified when new videos come out. See you soon.